thank you for tuning in. Uh, my name is Cole Akers and I'm a curator at The Glass House. I'd like to thank my colleagues at the Farnsworth House uh, for co-presenting tonight's program and to the um, New Canaan Library and the New Canaan Community Foundation for their ongoing partnership. Tonight's talk takes place on the occasion of Edith Farnsworth Reconsidered, an exhibition at the Farnsworth House that we'll hear more about tonight. The exhibition is part of Where Women Made History, the National Trust for Historic Preservation's multi-year initiative uh, to honor the female leaders, thinkers, and activists who contributed to American history and culture, and to protect the places where these women made their mark. I'm delighted to introduce Nora Wendell, an artist, writer, and educator who trained as an architect and whose work poetically engages uh, with history and the built environment through visual art, creative writing, and performance. She is Associate Professor of Architecture at the University of New Mexico and is completing a book on Edith Farnsworth and the Farnsworth House. She's a co-organizer of the show, um, about which we'll hear more in a moment, and it's been a real privilege to get to know her and her work. Um, I'll play a pre-recorded lecture that lasts about 40 minutes, and afterwards, Nora will be here to take your questions, so please feel free to use the Q&A button that's at the bottom of the screen. Um, while the video is playing, you may want to um, hide my video just so that way the, uh, clear up some real estate, uh, real estate on, the, on the screen. Uh, but in any case, uh, thanks again. Uh, the lecture will start in just a moment. My name is Nora Wendell, and I would like to thank Cole Akers and Scott Mahaffey for this opportunity to present Edith Farnsworth Reconsidered, an exhibition supported in part by the Graham Foundation and the National Trust for Historic Preservation. This exhibition presents the Dr. Edith Farnsworth House as it was inhabited by the client between 1951, just after Ms. Fandero finished the structure, and 1954, which is just prior to a damaging flood. I provided historical consulting for this exhibition in collaboration with Farnsworth House director Scott Mahaffey and Rob Kleinschmidt, an architect who was on the ground uh, with Scott in both Plano and Chicago, choosing the pieces that would go into this exhibition and in some cases actually reproducing elements of it for the installation. It is strange to be presenting an exhibition that I worked on for a year and yet have not seen in person. And it is strange too to be presenting in the format of a pre-recorded lecture to audiences that I cannot see. And yet I think in the midst of this pandemic and the distance that it creates is a certain kind of intimacy me in my home, speaking to you in your home about how Dr. Farnsworth lived in hers. And in this talk, I'm going to be presenting the house as the exhibition does, as an extension of Dr. Farnsworth's ambitions and desires, drawing upon elements of her personal history and her archive, as well as parts of the historiography, which has typically tried to erase her from having a sort of place in the history of architecture and in the history particularly of this building. Um, so, through that framework, we're going to be examining her life and the house in the context of her life. Edith Farnsworth Reconsidered was planned to open in late March of this year. On Friday, March 13th, 2020, the day that the U.S. declared a national emergency in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, I mailed what was left to be added to the exhibition to Mahaffey with no sense of what the future would hold. I carefully boxed up and mailed several first edition books that Dr. Farnsworth had read, a series of poems that she had written, which I retyped for this exhibition and currently sit on the Franco Albini table in the southeast corner of the house. And what I found when I was packaging up these poems is that the relevance of the poems that Dr. Farnsworth had been writing while she lived in the house to the moment that we are currently living in, which is very much an extension of, of what was happening in March, I was really astonished by the way that her poems resonated with this moment. The relevance of them shocked me. They resonate with the uncertainty that we are currently experiencing, especially in the United States, with no sign of COVID-19 slowing down and demands for social justice rising. In the poem, February Thought, Dr. Farnsworth meditates on such uncertainty. Since the Farnsworth house was her weekend house, she would drive 50 miles from her apartment in Chicago to the glass house in Plano on weekends. And in this poem, she describes a drive that she makes to the house through rural Illinois in the middle of winter, the world just starting to emerge from under a blanket of snow. 
In this poem, she asks, how is one to travel through a country without landmarks? Toward a destination so attenuated as nearly to be forgotten. There is a row of posts, but not a fence and not a field. Now looms the shadow of a maple tree without a landscape. On the right, you see a mailbox. Hoskins is the name, and soon another with the name J. Humphrey. No farmhouse is there to be seen. For the names, no bearer. How is one to travel through a country without landmarks? In architectural history, we typically examine the artifact, prioritizing its relationship to the biography of the architect. From that perspective, the Farnsworth House is canonical, one of the most important houses in the world. It was the first house that German architect Mies van der Rohe built in the United States, completing it in 1951, almost 15 years after emigrating to the US. This private commission changed his entire career. It allowed him to establish what Felice Lambert has described as the DNA of the rest of his American architecture. It is a freestanding, clear span, steel frame building with little division on the interior. As you can see from this floor plan, essentially an open one room house with little boundary between inside and outside because the glass makes every horizon visible at once. And of course, the detail of the vertical I-beams, columns that seem to glide up the outside of the building that appear to slide past the curtain wall. What is rendered invisible here are the countless human hours of welding, sanding, and painting necessary to conceal how these columns participate in the structure of the house, keeping the floor five feet off the ground. Nothing Mies had achieved in the United States before this project had this extraordinary appeal, though elements of it refer to the first glass house he drew for the US, but never realized, the Reeser House. When Mies met Dr. Farnsworth at a dinner party in 1945, she was exactly the client he needed at this point in his career. She was an established physician on staff at Passabat Memorial Hospital. She was also an assistant professor at Northwestern Medical School, and she was running her own research lab to find novel ways to cure a then fatal disease of the kidney called nephritis. She had very recently purchased a plot of land from Colonel McCormick, the owner of the Chicago Tribune, which had once been an experimental farm, a place where agricultural methods were tested. When Mies agreed at this dinner party to design a weekend house for Dr. Farnsworth, she began driving him out to the site just weeks later to begin planning the building. She was a client willing to spend copious amounts of time on site with him, and she was herself devoted to experimentation in her own work. So given this background, what is radical about an exhibition that focuses on how Dr. Farnsworth would eventually live in this house? What is radical about exhibiting this structure with her furniture, especially considering this mutual um, belief in experimentation that the architect and the client both had? The answer to why this is radical to exhibit the house as she lived in it, the answer to this question has to do with the difference between history as events actually occurred and history as the narrative that is produced after those events have taken place. From the moment the house was published, just after its completion in March 1951, so by now Dr. Farnsworth has been living in the house for three months, from the moment the house is published in its media debut in architectural forum in 1951, Dr. Farnsworth is already imagined as being gone, as no longer living in the structure. She is not imagined anymore as the namesake of the house or the client of the architect, but in the inaugural article presenting the house to the United States via the vehicle of architectural forum, she's imagined as being no more than a temporary tenant of the structure that bears her name. Quote, Mies is convinced that architecture should be no more than the shell within which each occupant produces his or her own dwelling. To put it another way, no romantic self-portraits of the architect, no inflexible portrayals of clients who in the long view may turn out to have only been temporary tenants. Mies believes that his architecture must be objective, impersonal, 
a quiet and simple space, a backdrop against which each individual and all human life and its great complexities can develop freely and develop in changing ways from generation to generation, long after such striking clients as Dr. Edith Farnsworth are gone. This article emerges in the midst of her lawsuit with the architect. In fact, she has served a summons in August, perhaps just after these photographs for that article are taken. The same summer that these photographs are taken, the summer of 1951, the office of Mies van der Rohe had been in correspondence with a Wayne Anderson architectural historian, asking him please to not photograph the house for his forthcoming book on American architecture as, quote, the problem of furnishing is far from resolved. In fact, Mies barely got the photographs he needed of the structure. These photographs by Bill Hedrick were only made possible with an intervention by the editor of Architectural Forum, who wrote a letter to Farnsworth and carbon copied Mies and photographer Bill Hedrick. Doug Haskell writes that he, quote, understands undergoing architectural photography is like undergoing major surgery, but he asks Farnsworth if she would allow it anyway. What we see in the photographs that Mies was able to get through Bill Hedrick is the house nearly empty, with just a few simple pieces of Dr. Farnsworth furniture arranged at very odd angles, and her black poodle waiting patiently outside the front door. Photographs in which the bed is eventually cropped out for publication. This is the moment that inspires the current exhibition at the house, a moment of great uncertainty. At this moment, Mies had sued Dr. Farns with her final unpaid bill of $4,000 to an electric contractor, as well as for his fees as an architect and as a contractor, although they had no contract binding their relationship as architect and client. There had been no clear budget, with Mies sharing estimates for work with Dr. Farnsworth, hiring the labor, paying the labor, and then being reimbursed by Dr. Farnsworth. This becomes complicated in court. Since there is no contract binding the two, when Dr. Farnsworth countersues Mies in October, alleging that he had misrepresented the cost of the house and his ability to produce it, the depositions and cross-examinations of the many witnesses extend well into the following year, 1952. The transcripts of this suit and countersuit swell to 4,000 pages, and it takes three years and two judges for a decision to be rendered. In the end, the two settle with Farnsworth paying $1,500. What is at stake in this moment of uncertainty, however, during the trial, is the ownership of the house. It's not simply money. In his complaint, Mies files a mechanics lien. Mies and his lawyers had stipulated in the complaint that should Dr. Farnsworth not be able to pay the approximately $30,000 they were asking, which would be on top of the 70000 she had already paid, the house would actually be given to Mies, and she and anyone related to her would be forever barred from the property. It was unclear during these years, from 1951 to 1954, if she would even maintain ownership of the structure. Typically, the house is presented as if that is exactly what happened, as if Dr. Farnsworth lost, and Mies occupied the structure with the furniture that he designed in the 1920s for his buildings in Europe. Furniture for the Barcelona Pavilion and the Tugendhat House typically filling the space. This is perhaps the legacy of the second owner, Lord Peter Palumbo, who restored the house at great expense after purchasing it from Dr. Farnsworth in the early 70s. But the truth is that we do not know how Mies truly intended the Farnsworth House to be furnished. Some references I have read and sketches I have seen suggests that he was working on a series of conchoidal chairs. Other sources I have read indicate that he'd imagined the Farnsworth house as being somewhat feral. Furniture upholstered in hides that are still covered in hair, which would actually corroborate the way in which Mies talks about the travertine as something you could walk across in shoes still muddy from a walk on the floodplain. So he imagined walking through the entire house with shoes that were you know, still had traces of the landscape on them. Late models from the office of Musandero show its interior looking very much like what we typically see on a tour. It's difficult to align Dr. Farnsworth's life with this historically 
inaccurate but commonly held vision of how the house was inhabited. I tried once to occupy the house as she had, despite the wrong furniture, for two hours in 2017. I even hired a violinist to play a piece that Dr. Farnsworth used to practice in the house, Vitaly's Chacona. I chose this piece because it came from a moment in her life that I think of as defining the same part of her character that led her to build the house. Dr. Farnsworth was raised in Chicago and generational wealth, family ownership of two lumber companies, one in Wisconsin and one in Michigan, made her life extremely comfortable. She studied English and zoology at University of Chicago, and then during the late 1920s, when she was just entering adulthood, she lived abroad, studying in Rome with Mario Corti with hopes of becoming a concert violinist. She gives up on the violin while she's in Rome, and she begins hanging out with Umberto Barbaro and the poets that he introduces her to, becoming, in her words, an anti-fascist. Edith Farnsworth identifies in this era as anti-fascist, and this is a period of time in which she has a measure of independence. In her memoirs, she calls these years simply her years of vague expansion. During these years, her late teens to her late 20s, and perhaps as far as her early 30s, she writes that she found herself, quote, released from dimensions that I was used to thinking of as mine. So wide, so long, so thick, and with certain traits thrown in, but always through the refractions of other people's eyes. But now, she writes, there is nothing to limit one's transcending. I have memorized this passage from her unpublished memoir by reading her tangled handwriting over and over. Written when she was in her 70s and living in Italy, these pages are not a diary. She tells, her, she tells her version of events from the perspective of the end of her life, with distance, often less concerned with the details of the external world, and more concerned with the impacts of places, events, and people on what might be called her internal world. In this passage where she recalls standing on the deck of the ship as it approaches Mount Vesuvius alone in her 20s. She doesn't describe the volcano, but what its presence does to her, releasing her from other people's limiting constructions of who she is or could be, as she puts it, but now there is nothing to limit one's transcending. During this very formative time in her life, she was friends with Molly Dusen, feminist and political activist, and her partner, Polly Porter, the social worker whose family had a summer home in Castine, Maine, where Farnsworth's family also spent summers. Farnsworth would spend a winter in Paris with Catherine Butler Hathaway, who also had a house in Castine, staying in what Farnsworth describes as, quote, squalid studio rooms on the left bank. She does not categorize her relationships with these women as anything other than friendships, although Molly Dusen and Polly Porter were out queer women and a couple. Dr. Farnsworth is opaque in her statements about this time in her life. The line between private and public life is one that she carefully towed. In fact, at the end of her life when she was living in Italy, after having sold the house to Peter Palumbo, John Maxson, an official at the Art Institute of Chicago, spent several days trying to convince her to give him her papers. And he told her that he would be her literary executor and that what he would do with her papers would be to modify them to show a reconciliation between a great architect and a great client. She rejects the idea completely and she becomes very protective of her papers, which I think lends to some of the opacity about her relationships with um, people in her, the early parts of her life. Returning to the United States after these years of big expansion, Dr. Frenchworth writes that she meets an Ellis Bourbon, a Swedish doctor and professor, a pioneer in the fields of radiotherapy and clinical oncology. They meet on her trip back to the United States as she's sailing across the Atlantic. Inspired by Bourbon's pursuit of what she calls quote unquote facts toward the cause of public health, she decides to study medicine. In doing this, Dr. Farnsworth was reclaiming a narrative about her life in a time in which women were often spoken for. And even in this letter from one of her professors to admit her to an internship following medical school, she's described as being of neat appearance, excellent character and habits, above average in her scholarship, but prompt, reliable, cooperative, and industrious. In other words, smart, but not too smart, and not a challenge. 
I am sure that this was not accurate. She seems to me to have been extremely intelligent, but undoubtedly this coded language was very important for her to get into this internship. When she graduated in 1938 from Northwestern Medical School, she was one of only four women admitted per graduating class, a rule that was in place until the 1960s. And when this announcement is made in the Chicago Tribune about her medical career, years after she's graduated, she's noted for being, quote, a girl with a splendid physique, no doubt a strange way of speaking about a 39-year-old physician and researcher. Historically, it's been assumed that Mies was his own client for the house, but I believe that he understood Dr. Farnsworth's ambitions and that he understood that he was taking on a formidable partner in this project, one who would see the project as belonging to her as well. Dr. Farnsworth always insisted on this as a project. She doesn't call it a house in her manuscript, memoir, or letters. She calls it her Fox River House project. And I think that her purchase of this very specific piece of land, which was also previously an experimental farm, and her friendships with these women who insisted on the autonomy of women probably contributed to this vision of hers. Farnsworth also admired Mies very much. And in fact, Mies trusted her understanding of his work so much that he invited her to write an essay about it that he wanted to use instead of James Spire's essay for the MoMA catalog of his retrospective exhibition in 1947 where the Farnsworth House was presented in the form of a model and watercolor drawing for the first time. In this essay, Farnsworth writes that, quote, concealed in these simple structures are some of the most memorable innovations of modern architecture. But she writes, they're innovations not in subjective fantasy, but human experience. Edith truly believed that the Farnsworth House model and drawing were the pivotal part of the exhibition at MoMA and she believed that the Farnsworth House would become a prototype of new and important elements of American architecture. So she very much understood the significance of the structure that she had commissioned. In 1949 and 1950, when the design of the structure is being resolved and construction begins, Dr. Farnsworth arguably had never been busier. Her experiments with ACTH, a synthetic hormone that was produced from the pituitary glands of hogs, and the image on the left you can actually see um, an entire container of those. So her experiments with the synthetic hormone produced from pituitary glands of hogs uh, were successfully treating patients with kidney disease. And this research was making national headlines. She is credited with the first clinical use of ACTH in the treatment of nephrotic syndrome in 1948. And at the same time, she's learning how to publish this research and needing to do it very quickly to get credit for her work. A very difficult balance in academia still for women and junior researchers especially. She was so busy, in fact, that the architects in Mises' office were often drawing her charts and graphs for publications, so she would collect the data she needed, go to Mises' office, and the people working as architects in his firm would actually be producing the charts and graphs that she presented at conferences, that she published in papers. So there's quite a bit of fluidity between the two um, in terms of awareness and respect for one another's research. She was also collecting significant funds for her research, so the pressure was definitely on her to produce. And this was $10,000 uh, paid to her directly for her lab, just one of very many um, gifts. And Randolph Bohr ends up being, who, who offers this fund, ends up actually being her lawyer representing her in her countersuit of Nice. So to Farnsworth, the mutual projects were an advantage. In her words, the simultaneous realization of Mises innovation in architecture and mine in fluid and salt metabolism seemed to me just as it should be and absolutely thrilling. Notwithstanding a few disagreements and tensions, she writes, the summer of 1949 was brilliant and exciting. For me, that summer was marvelous because it fulfilled my ideal that persons trained in different fields of the arts or the sciences should seek to understand the ideals and the principles common to all fields of advancement and to lend their loyalty and support. Though the disagreements between the two have been narrativized as a romance gone awry with little to no evidence, the reality is perhaps much more boring. This was an experimental structure cited in an experimental way, just 100 feet from a river that continues to flood to this day and in fact did so very recently. 
Um, and it first flooded before construction was even finished. I'm sure something that was very concerning to her. The disagreements in the process of building the house revolved around experimentation as well as choice. Dr. Farnsworth didn't want furniture of Mises' design, but to choose her own and expressed her opinions about curtains, at one point requesting brown curtains before agreeing to the Shantan curtains that were eventually installed. Without a doubt, this is an experimental structure for Mies too, and even as late as July 1950, five months before she moves in, Mies proposed an interior divided by several curtains to indicate the locations of different zones or rooms in the house. The Farnsworth house was always, and perhaps still is, an experiment. The exhibition Edith Farnsworth Reconsidered shows us the house as Dr. Farnsworth took ownership of it. Scott Mahaffey and Rob Kleinschmidt did exhaustive research to determine what pieces Dr. Farnsworth had in the house, pouring over countless photographs from many archives and personal collections, including those belonging to the families of the architects who worked for Nice. What they found was that Dr. Farnsworth was not alone in making her furniture selections. She worked closely with a friend, Kitty Baldwin, interior designer and partner of architect Harry Weiss, who co-owned an interior design firm and furniture showroom, Baldwin Kingry, with Jody Kingry Albergo. Together, they selected some iconic modern pieces for the house that create a series of zones. As you walk into the house on the left or the northwest corner is a dining room. And this exhibition imagines the table is set for Saturday lunch with two guests. A contemporary table originally designed by Florence Knoll in 1952, painted steel with a teak veneer top, is set with flatware loaned by Russell Wright. His casual line from 1951 and the pinch flatware from 1952. Chaise lounge chairs designed by Bruno Matheson, originally designed in the early 1930s of laminated beech wood with woven hemp straps were located in the southwest corner of the house when Dr. Farnsworth lived there, and she would move them from the screened terrace into the house very easily because the house had no AC, any air conditioning until 1997. So they're located here in exactly the place that Dr. Farnsworth would have them because of the proximity to the covered porch. And for the space in which Dr. Farnsworth would have entertained her guests, people ranging from Richard and Dion Neutra, who came to visit her, two local friends. Here she is with Beth Dunlap. Um, the front room facing south toward the Fox River is full of furniture. It's organized around a contemporary wool rug inspired by the rug that Dr. Farnsworth owned, one that was created by the Beni Orain people of Northwest Africa. Another Florence Knoll table is joined by contemporary versions of Jen Rizom chairs made by Knoll, originally designed in 1943. And Scott found that the original versions of these chairs would have actually been made of surplus parachute straps from World War II. Slipper chairs from 1951 in the foreground are custom replicas that were actually made for this exhibition um, based on photographs that were available. Scott Mahaffey even had Dr. Farnsworth's original daybed from 1952 recreated. And I should say, this is not Dr. Farnsworth in this photograph. We're not sure who she is. Um, but it is not Dr. Farnsworth. Um, however, the bed, uh, the daybed was recreated. And um, Mahaffey suspects that the original daybed may have been designed by Harry Weiss. It was uh, reproduced for this exhibition. And Dr. Farnsworth's writing space occupies the east end of the house, next to where she slept. Here, a contemporary version of a Franco Albini table designed in 1928 and introduced to the, uh, to the U.S. by Knoll in 1947 supports a vintage Olivetti typewriter and a selection of Edith's poems that I reproduced in my office at the University of New Mexico on a student's friend's grandfather's beautiful vintage typewriter. To the left of the desk is the freestanding wardrobe that held Dr. Farnsworth's clothes and also doubled as a high fidelity stereo system and contained her records. This is a contemporary recreation since the original was produced in 1952, designed by Bill Dunlap, since she was no longer at that time on speaking terms with Nice. And the original is actually still on site. It's, it's um, been restored and it's moved into a exhibition space near the visitor center. So the piece that's in the Farnsworth house currently is actually a really beautiful replica of that original closet. 
a few photographs that we were able to find did show where Dr. Farnsworth slept and the bed seemed to float around and not have a very specific location. So from historic photographs, Scott was able to determine that it, it was most likely during this time located on the east end of the house and that it would have probably been placed on the floor, but for this exhibition, we've moved it to a standard height. It did not have a headboard or footboard. It was a very simple bed. Um, and to the left of the bed are first editions of books that Dr. Farnsworth read and in particular, one that she would argue with Mies about, including, it was called What is Life by Erin Schrodinger. And they had different views of the afterlife. Dr. Farnsworth was incredibly pragmatic about what happens after a human being dies. And she and, and Mies would argue at length about this because Mies found it very unspiritual and not very comforting. So we've included that next to the bed as a sort of um, reference to that, that tension. Around the corner from the bed, is the kitchen, and this is where we place Dr. Farnsworth's favorite afternoon beverage, vermouth. She was known for drinking vermouth in the afternoons, and so we've left it here for her as a sort of offering and a few different glasses. And we have here a view of the kitchen from the west end of the house looking east, so that you can see the way that the photographs have been inspiring how objects are placed even in the kitchen. After the conclusion of the trial in 1955, Dr. Farnsworth lived in the Farnsworth house until the late 60s, moving to Italy until in 1969. I find the time that she lived here, 15 years after the close of the trial, to be a fairly remarkable period of time. So she turned to an early love of hers, writing, and in particular, she wrote her own poetry and translated Italian modern poets, the ones she was introduced to by Umberto Barbaro earlier in her life. She translated those Italian modern poets into English. The house became her setting for a transformation into a poet and a translator of poetry. In this, I think she was inspired by the transformative potential of the structure upon her life. In some places describing, quote, its luminous walls and her inhabitation here as, quote, secluded by reflection. She was highly attuned to the transformative reality of the glass walls, rarely transparent and more often highly reflective. And she would go on in the last 10 years of her life after leaving the Farnsworth House and living in Italy to produce three translations of poetry, book length. And so she would produce Salvatore Quasimodo, um, Eugenio Montale, who would later win a Nobel Prize, and Albino Piero. And some sources actually argue that she was the first translator to bring Eugenio Montale's poetry to English reading audiences, something that I think few people are aware of. For Dr. Farnsworth, the Farnsworth House was certainly about more than architecture. She identified in Mises' architecture as she herself writes, quote, innovations of human experience. In the interpretation of this historic architecture through the lens of the client who lived there, we hope that some of this is traceable. And I couldn't resist throwing in a few more historic images of this house as we rarely see or imagine it, especially with one of Edith's beloved Poodles, Amy, and her friend Beth Dunlap. Apparently, her dogs had the run of the house, and they're described by guests who would visit as running through the house, out of it, back into it. And Dr. Farnsworth uh, gave them a lot of space to occupy it. So I wish that we had poodles in this installation. We don't, but um, it would have made it very, very authentic. This installation isn't meant to be viewed as a world frozen in time as an historical reenactment of a lost moment in architectural history, but rather we hope it's seen as an opportunity to see the house inhabited by the desires and dreams of the person who co-created it, who brought the opportunity to Mies, who joined him in a vision for a place in rural Illinois. Desires and dreams are elusive. They live in us and the things that we do and the people that we touch are the only evidence of them. The history that I have traced that led up to this installation is only a partial history. It is incomplete. It doesn't account for Dr. Farnsworth's tussle with the county over two acres of her land. Two acres that the county eventually seizes in order to widen a bridge. Leading up to losing these acres, Dr. Farnsworth made very public statements about the lineage of the land, acknowledging that it belonged to indigenous people. She attempted to offer the land for a public park after her death 
if the county would cease trying to take it. She did not attempt to find channels for reparations or acknowledge by that the same logic of the land not belonging to the county, the land could not belong to her. In 50 years, the conversation has changed so much, and I wonder whether she would have had the same views today as she had then, if she would have seen herself as a property owner, or if she would have taken the longer view of the devastating impacts of centuries of colonization. Dr. Farnsworth eludes me. I think she eludes all of us. Biographically, Edith Brooks Farnsworth is described as a physician, researcher, musician, poet, authority on 20th century Italian literature. She has many identities, which is what makes fitting her into architectural history difficult at times, because she cannot be contained in one category. Sue Sikarski of Northwestern Memorial Hospital Archives has pointed out to me that Dr. Farnsworth's biography changes toward the end of her life. Its emphasis on her career in poetry becoming much more apparent. She describes herself simply here in this translation of Eugenio Montale's work that appeared in the Transatlantic Review in the summer of 1969. The biography is simple, and reference to her being a physician occurs only in title. Dr. Edith B. Farnsworth lives in Chicago and is well known as a poet and an authority on Italian literature. Her identity continued to change throughout her life, and in the visitor center of the Farnsworth House, a series of panels traces the history of her identity. This was meticulously designed by Ellen Tucker at the University of New Mexico, and just recently installed for visitors to view before a tour. As Farnsworth's identity changed, so did her ways of understanding and seeing the Farnsworth House. Before she left the Farnsworth House, Dr. Farnsworth had a set of photographs created. It is unclear if she took them, which is possible because she studied photography with Harry Callahan, or if someone else took the photographs and perhaps she art directed them. What is compelling is that Dr. Farnsworth created a set of photographs that reproduce the precise views that Bill Hedrick took of the house, the very first photographs produced in 1951, the ones that informed this exhibition. Both of these sets of photographs exist in her archive at the Newberry. Both are the Farnsworth House through very different eyes. In 1951, we see an emphasis on transparency and abstraction. By the time Dr. Farnsworth documents the house, weeds and plants have grown up around the columns. The trees overtake the house, shrouding it in leaves. Roller blinds have replaced the curtains and heavy dark furniture clashes with the austerity of white painted steel and travertine, but seems somehow comforting, inviting, and strangely familiar. The fact that these two collections of photographs mingle in the same archival box is a reminder that history is not static. It is an act of construction. And when history is done right, it is never done never too precious to be rewritten so that it still means something to us today. At the close of her memoirs, Dr. Farnsworth dedicates her writing to her companions, as she calls them, the people unknown to her that she drove alongside on her way to the Farnsworth house, drives that she describes as eerie, that she often undertook alone or with her dogs. And yet in her isolation, partly a circumstance of her identity as a single ambitious woman in mid-century America, and partly a circumstance of social suspicions of such an identity. She did not think of herself as alone, but as one individual part of a collective. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nora, um, <clears throat> for um, making that lecture for us. Um, I wonder if you could, um, if you could start maybe by speaking a little bit about how you first came to work on the Farnsworth House and, and maybe then how you became involved in, in this project. Sure. Um, I'm just looking at myself. I'm trying to see if there's another way. No, okay. Uh, so I came to start working on the project, uh, I think in 2003 is when I started my master's degree in architecture at Iowa State and I had um, 
some wonderful professors, uh, Charlie Masterson and uh, Mitchell Squire, who's still very much a friend and um, mentor in many ways. And they, they had sort of conspired to leave an article on my desk. And it was the, it was the article called um, Sex and Real Estate. It was one that came out in 2003 when the Farnsworth House was being um, auctioned via Sotheby's. And um, they left it on my desk, I think, because they knew I, you know, I, was, I was also taking courses in creative writing and I was really interested in narratives about architecture. And it was such a compelling and maybe too perfectly organized story to be believed. You know, the story of um, a client and architect whose entire fallout was around a sort of speculation about romance. And I became interested in it. And the article did such a kind of mm, not very compelling job rendering her as a human being and as a character that I got really interested in who she was. And so I started going to the Newberry and reading her memoirs and I just became absolutely fascinated by who she was. Um, much more fascinated in who she actually was and who she saw herself to be actually is maybe what I found to be more interesting. Not so much the narrative that somebody else would make about her, but the narrative that she was actively creating out of her life. I think she saw herself as a sort of character in her, in her story. Um, so I became really fascinated just by the way she wrote about her life. And I think it was through her writing and her descriptions of the world she was a part of that I started to see a potential for like um, opening up another way of looking at that history. That's so great. Um, there's one question that came in here is, um, I, you know, I guess as as maybe is to be expected, there's there's some interest about the um, you know the kind of acrimony between between yeah. Meade and, and Farnsworth, yeah. and uh, you know the the question that's come in is did they ultimately sort of work it out? What was the kind of afterlife of that? Um, I don't I don't think they did, and in fact, I find it kind of telling that she lets go of the house after he dies. <laughs> I think she. Um, I think they never spoke again. I think she felt very betrayed. There was a slide in the presentation that talks about, I think it's Mies in, in, a, in a trial scenario and he's talking about um, the estimates and that there, there was kind of, they were aiming at a certain number financially of what the house would cost and they were kind of always missing that mark. And in the end, the person who delivers the news to her is Myron Goldsmith. And I think she takes it extremely personally that she didn't get the news from Mies himself. And I think she was just the kind of person who held on to things. Um, and and I, I don't think they ever resolved that, um, mm. that dispute. And I'm, I doubt they ever spoke again. That's just my sense from reading what I've read is that I don't believe they ever spoke to one another again. And I don't think that he really ever saw the house again. There's a, another question that's come in um, asking how the, you know, this history of the dispute, which seems to be the fixation, right, of, 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 of so many, um, does, did that, uh, the, the question asks, does that, did that damage the view of modern architecture as unlivable? Or maybe another way to ask that question is, um, what has been the effect of, of the, the prevalence of that narrative, right, um, within the, the field of architectural history? I mean, certainly your work is, is addressing that. Uh, so, could you? I'm sorry. Could you ask the question again? Just oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> did the did the history of the dispute um, sort of have damage or have an effect on on the idea that modern architecture is somehow unlivable? I don't know. You know, I think I think what probably damaged it more was maybe what came out in House Beautiful. So I didn't talk about the some of the some of the media storm that happened during the trial, which included um, Mies going to the Chicago Tribune and, and doing a series of interviews about the livability of glass houses. So trying to create this sort of media um, image of glass houses is very livable, very affordable, very practical. And then at the same time, Dr. Farnsworth goes to House Beautiful and she, you know, I think very consciously decides to do two articles, one with Elizabeth Gordon and one with um, uh, another writer whose name is escaping me right now, where she describes the glass house as being part of a sort of campaign to destroy American democracy. So I think, you know, I think, I don't think she really believed that, but I think she saw the stakes as being that she could lose the house. And I think she was aware of 
the power of narrative. Um, I don't know if the trial impacted modern architecture so much or if it was more just this, um, you know, moment in the United States that was really kind of focused on what does a glass house mean? What does it mean to have everything on view? It was, of course, a McCarthy era, you know, fear around, you know, a xenophobic fear around architects coming from outside of the country and proposing such projects. But there were, of course, a lot of glass houses. I mean, um, after this, it doesn't seem so wild, right? So I think it's just the moment. Um, and But I would say that probably the trial informed it less than maybe the media surrounding it, because of course, Elizabeth Gordon um, does quite a bit of damage to this idea of modernism. Um, another question that, that's come in um, has asked about uh, Dr. Farnsworth collecting pra uh, practices. You know, for example, you should have these really um, beautiful images of the house that have, for example, these sort of lion-like sculptures um, right on the, on the steps or just adjacent to the steps. Um, do you have a sense of what her collecting practices were like? Yeah, yeah. So she would collect, I don't know the names of the places that she would go, but I got a lot of information from a curator at the Art Institute of Chinese Objects. And that curator told me that um, they had actually received a lot of Dr. Farnsworth's objects, at, you know, in her will after she passed. She'd got, they'd gotten a lot of these. And she had a habit of collecting these somewhere in downtown Chicago. I don't know precisely where she was going. I know that um, a lot of them were not high, high quality. So the, so the sculptures on the porch, those are excellent and they're owned by the Smart Museum right now. So they're outside of the museum. And so we couldn't get the originals. And so those on the porch at the Farnsworth House are, are replicas, but some of her artifacts were great artifacts and some were just not of great quality. So I think she had maybe varied practices. And I think that probably the things that she collected were just things that she gravitated toward less than um, having a very specific provenance. Um, a, a question's come in from um, our friend Scott Mahaffey, um, who yeah. asks if you could comment on the interrelated history um, of the Farnsworth House and the Glass House in the Yeah, Canada. of course. Um, as I understand it, of course, um, Mies had the idea for the Farnsworth House, but the Glass House was done quicker because, um, you know, that's, I, I suppose Philip Johnson was just faster since he was his own client. Um, that's all I know is that, right. uh, I guess what I've heard is that Philip Johnson came into this, the studio office of Mies van der Rohe, saw some drawings on the table, said, what are you doing? You can't build a glass house. And Mies explained what he was doing. And then the lore is that then Philip Johnson went and did it um, quicker than Mies did. Um, but I don't know much more than that, except that that timeline is um, something that I've heard. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, he, uh, Johnson, as you as you suggest, Johnson, you know, sees this project as he's organizing the the Mies exhibition for MoMA, right? So of course, it sort of enters, yeah. you know, enters the the water supply, as it were, at that point. <laughs> um, let's see here. Um, so so many great questions. Um, Someone asked if you could um, speak a little bit about the utility core for the house. Um, you know, sort of how how is that organized? Maybe you could sort of illuminate that a bit. Yeah, I mean, there's a famous line in her memoir where she refers to the utility core as um, my misconception because it's um, playing on the word misconception because she argues that she has an experience of the house where something needs to be fixed in the utility core and only the person who's come to fix it has brought his son who's small and only the child can fit in there to fix it. I think that might have been a dramatization. I don't know. I haven't personally been in the utility core, but um, probably Scott can speak to it more clearly. But I do find the whole notion of, of waste coming into the building and all of the, you know, movement of stacks, electricity, everything coming through that center part really interesting. And of course, the maple tree planted in front of it or it was pre-existing, the maple tree being in front of it as a way to sort of um, mask that stack was also really, really smart. So, I mean, from an aesthetic point of view, I find it really brilliant. From a practical point of view, Dr. Farnsworth found it annoying, but um, yeah, I can't speak from experience. 
Um, one question that gets, that's come in is, um, do you see Farnsworth uh, choices um, of furniture or her arrangements of furnishings and personal effects as um, conflicting with the house in any way or fighting against it? Do you feel like there was some sort of, um, uh, yeah, as if, if I'm reading correctly, kind of like antagonism, I should, I should say. I don't know. I mean, I, I definitely know she, she didn't want Mises furniture. I don't know if that was antagonistic. I mean, mm -hmm, uh, sure. you know, I, I can't say that that was antagonism. I think, I think she was really excited to work with her friend, Kitty Baldwin. They chose beautiful pieces for the house that, you know, from my perspective, seem very comfortable. The Chase Lounge, they're lightweight pieces. She could move around. They're kind of appropriate, I think, to a house that didn't have air conditioning. So in the summer, especially, they seem more appropriate than heavy furniture that would be covered in leather. Um, I don't think it was antagonism. I, I think she was pretty pragmatic. I mean, putting her mattress on the floor and treating it and letting her dogs run around. I think she had a view of this as a place that she would spend time, both inside and outside. She gardened. She, you know, um, felt that it was she parked her car right in front of it. It was, you know, she didn't treat it as a sort of precious object. So I would say probably the furniture wasn't necessarily antagonistic, but was maybe a little bit more pragmatic. Later on, when she does move in that overstuffed couch, I do start to wonder <laughs> what that's about. <laughs> but that might have just been comfort, you know, maybe she was spending more time out there. Who doesn't love an overstuffed couch? Absolutely. Um, another, um, uh, question might be about the the state of her archives. Where are they now? Um, which archives did you consult for your research? What was that process like? So it's been, I would say, probably a 15 year process because she, her archives, her letters, all of her effects, those are at the Newberry in Chicago. Very easy to access, wonderful. Um, but if you want images of the house during construction, you'd have to go to the Canadian Center for Architecture, Museum of Modern Art, um, Art Institute of Chicago's Ryerson and, and Burnham Libraries. So images of the house being constructed really are not part of her archive, but her narrative of her life is part of her archive. So it's been, it's required lots of traveling and research and um, chasing things. And, you know, and Scott can speak to that too, because he's had to chase down so many images, many of them coming actually from families of architects who worked for me. Who did have really interesting documentation of the entire process of building it, visiting the site, those sorts of things. So um, I would say, you know, it's like any research project, you know, countless, countless places, some formal collections and some informal. Mm. Um, another question that's coming in is to talk a little bit about the book that you're currently working on about um, about Farnsworth. How is that going? Uh, where are you in the process and, and how are you shaping the book? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've learned not to speak too much about projects in process in public. <laughs> um, as an academic, you learn that can get complicated. Um, but I will say that it's um, wrapping up and it's formed around a series of what I would call interior perspectives. So really informed by the way Dr. Farnsworth viewed the world that she was a part of. So not just exclusively the house, but the sort of landscape of her life. And there are elements of it that include my relationship to her archive as well. So I think at the beginning of the lecture, I spoke a little bit about, um, and it, I think throughout the lecture, you saw elements of my practice, which involves um, my physical engagement of archives, artifacts, things that are effects of this history. So the book is a series of internal perspectives, or I call interior perspectives, um, both mine and Dr. Farnsworth's on that history. That's great. I'll look forward to that. Yeah, there's so many other wonderful questions, um, but I think what I'll do is say that, um, you know, Nora, you've done such an amazing job of um, creating a, a video archive on the Farnsworth um, website, and I would really encourage everyone to um, have a look at some of these wonderful conversations that Nora has had with um, scholar Alice Friedman, um, the artist Gerard and Kelly, um, that really goes into um, other aspects of the house's history in such a lovely, nuanced um, way. Um, so I think that's a really great place to get more information, not only about Farnsworth herself, but um, also about um, the exhibition um, that's on view. 
Um, so with that, uh, Nora, thanks again for this fantastic talk and um, hope you stay well and hope to see you in person sometime soon. Absolutely, it was such a pleasure and thank you to everybody who came to be part of this. It's been really rewarding to realize that even though we can't be together in one place, there are ways to create a community online. And I just wanna thank you so much for this opportunity. It's been a real pleasure and thank you to Scott and Rob and um, everyone at the Farnsworth House who made this an amazing project. Cool, thanks so much. Thank you very much, take care. All right, bye for now. Bye.